Okay, good afternoon again, everyone. Um, it is 530, so we're going to get started. And I know there are a few folks that um, will likely uh, join us in the next few minutes. Um, my name is um, Emily Manigo. I'm the Director of Virtual School Programs here in Richland School District 2. And with me this evening from the Virtual School Program um, are Mrs. Tisha Gibson, who is our Director of Counseling, and Mrs. Erin Armstrong, who is our Lead Teacher for Virtual School Program. Um, and we are so happy that you guys are joining us this afternoon. And as I said, um, we'll probably have folks joining us. Um, I want to let you know up front that we are recording. You're muted. I can't hear anything. Hello? Okay. Did you guys miss everything or did I just get muted in the middle? Oh, Second. I muted the entire time? Okay, just at the end. Okay, I was just introduced. I don't know that if um, if you guys heard me introduce Mrs. Gibson, Miss Armstrong. The introductions went through and then you got muted. Okay, okay. Um, so thank you. I apologize for that. Um, what I, the only thing that I said after um, the introductions was to let you know that we are recording this because we had a number of families that were unable to join us this evening for this virtual orientation. But we're glad that those of you that could attend are here. And we have about 63 um, participants online. And um, that is just a fraction of the family. So we know that um, there are a lot of folks that were probably unable to join us or may join us a little bit late this evening. Um, this will be, as I said, it's recorded and it will be shared with everyone. So even if you're on this evening and you miss something or would like to go back through it again, it will be available. We'll be sending that out, um, this out tomorrow afternoon with some additional information. So just to make sure that you're in the right spot, this is the parent, guardian, and student orientation for the eSchool program for the 2021-22 school year. Um, and this is expressly for middle school and high school families. We do have an elementary program that is housed um, at Lake Carolina. And so um, family, some of you I know have students that are in the elementary program. Additional information will be coming out once teachers return next week. Um, with um, regards to the elementary program, middle and high are just a little bit different. So we wanted to get a jump on issues such as scheduling because our students of course will be changing classes. And this is most important for students who are coming to us from the fifth grade that have the big com, um, transition from fifth to sixth where they will have a lot of them for the first time, multiple teachers um, in, in their content areas, as well as our eighth to ninth grade students that for the first time will be experiencing classes um, that are required and necessary for graduation. So again, thank you guys for joining us. Um, throughout this presentation, um, Miss both Mrs. Gibson and Miss um, Armstrong will probably um, interject with additional information and we will have opportunity at the very end of the meeting um, for you guys to ask any questions. So thank you to those of you that sent questions in in advance and we have answers to all of those questions. They were softball questions. I think we'll get some harder questions this evening, um, but we're again are excited um, that you guys are joining us. So we're gonna go ahead and get started and I'm going to share my screen. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and Ms. Armstrong, you're the only person I can see now. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen? Perfect, thank you so much. Okay, so thank you guys again for attending our orientation this session this evening. And we are going to start by talking a little bit about our um, theme for this year that our, some of our teachers, virtual teachers came up with that we hope encapsulates what we are trying to do here. We know that this is a, much like last year, a very different and potentially difficult year. Um, this was supposed to be, or we thought we were hoping um, about the middle of the year last year that things would slow down with COVID and that this year, the virtual school program at the middle school and high school level, which will exist beyond COVID, that this program would be about virtual learning, families and students, who thrive, students who thrive in the 
um, in the virtual environment and families who want that flexibility and option um, for, their, for their children. Um, unfortunately, we are in another COVID year, um, but we are ready to um, face any of the challenges that we know we will have um, you know, with as much grace as possible. And we're really ready. Our teachers, we've got a great staff of teachers, K through 12, um, but we're here to talk about our middle school and high school teachers. So I say our middle school and high school teachers are exceptional. And the theme this year is the future is now with virtually endless possibilities. And so this is what our, the work that we're doing with our students is going to center on as much as possible this year. We all know that there are things that we have to do by district requirement and by state law, but we want students and our families to understand that our ultimate goal is to prepare students for a bright future. And that we believe that through virtual learning in Richland too, there are endless possibilities, especially in the current climate. So as we begin, I've already introduced Ms. Armstrong, our lead teacher, and Mrs. Gibson, our director of counseling. But we have a tiny URL here, as well as a QR code. And so if you would take a minute, I'm going to just give about 30 seconds. If you would write this information down, or if you have your cell phone available, if you would take a snapshot of this QR code, there is some information that we would like to gather from each and every one of you. What we find often is that the information in Power School changes from time to time. Um, families move, um, families get new cell phone, parents get new cell phone numbers, they change their email address because they abandon the one that all the junk mail is going to, and they, put a, they get a new email address that's fresh and clean or it's the email address that they want school information to go to. So if you would take some time to do that, what we're gonna do is take that information to make sure that our teachers have the most up-to-date information on our families, because often we will email or call and we don't get anyone. It's, it's, a, it's no longer a working number or the email address either bounces back or the, or the parents would like for us to use a different email address. So. I'm just going to give you a few more seconds if you would write this information down. And please take the time to fill out this information. If you don't fill it out during this orientation or for those of you that are watching the recording, then we're going to track we're going to be tracking you down in the next few weeks to make sure that we have the most up to date information. And we will be sharing this information um, with your students zone schools if it is something that's different. Um, because um, this is information that's in Power School. We want this information in Power School if it's the most accurate information. Okay. So thank you again. And by the way, we, I, this information will be available. You will see this slide again at the end of the presentation. So if you don't quite get it now, we'll give you another opportunity towards the end. So thank you very much for that. Okay. So we're gonna begin this evening by talking a little bit about the difference between zone schools and the e-school program. And the really, the major difference is clearly in the title of this slide. The e-school is a program, not a school. The State Department of Education um, designates schools through a long application process. And at this time, the State Department of Education is not validating any virtual school programs, but they are allowing programs connected to school districts to operate as, pro, as a program would. So think about this, for those of you that have been in the district or are familiar with our magnet programs, like the Center for Knowledge, the Center for Achievement, those are programs, they're not schools. And so we have to operate just a little bit differently than a lot of our schools, and especially at the middle school and high school levels. So one of the things that we decided to do this year or needed to do this year, um, at the elementary level was that we moved all of the elementary students to Lake Carolina for just this one year um, so that they would all be in one place and it makes it just a little bit easier in power school. Unfortunately, at the middle school and high school level, due to a lot of state regulations and a lot of important things like um, high school league rules for athletes um, and for those uh, students who participate in fine arts, performing fine arts, students have to be attached to their zoned schools. And so to all the students that are part of the program, every single family, every student that is on this call this evening, you are still attached to your zone, but you are being served 
by the eSchool program for this year. So we want to... I'm sorry, if you're not muted, would you please mute yourself? I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. So we wanted to give you a few examples of things that were would be done at your zone school as opposed to the e-school program. So you will pay school fees at your zone schools. And this year, something that's great um, that is a, a significant, I consider a significant change having been in the district for a long time, is that school fees have been streamlined. So students will pay a flat middle school fee and a flat high school fee in most cases, and they will pay their technology fee, that technology insurance. And you will pay that through Parent Portal and that information or face-to-face, -face, if you'd like to prefer to do it in that way, you would need to do that at your student's zoned school or through parent portal. So we don't take any money as a program. So we can't, we can't, we can't take your check or your credit card. So they have to do that through parent portal. You have to do that through parent portal or your student's zone school. Any technology issues, again, your student is assigned to their zone school. And so if there's any tech major technology issues, such as needing to trade out a Chromebook, those that will happen at their at their zone schools textbooks most of our teachers are going to use digital textbooks this year so you won't have to pick up textbooks but there are situations where um, students for a number of different reasons will need a textbook and textbooks are handled at a student's zone schools and then school pictures we've gotten some questions about senior pictures um, and yearbook pictures those things are handled at the student's zone schools okay um, and we'll have time at the end. So if you have any questions as we go along in this presentation, if you would make some notes, put it on a, on a, on a sheet of paper or sticky, and at the end, we'll give you an opportunity to unmute and ask any questions. I know that, that some of this may be a, um, a little bit complicated. Um, the eSchool program, on the other hand, we will handle student schedules. So Ms. Gibson has been working fast and furiously in trying to get student schedules in the system. And I think um, the majority of students have their schedules in the system already. Now you may have requested some changes or adjustments to your schedule and she's working on those and she'll be working on those um, over the next week. So please be patient with her. And she's gonna give you some instructions in a bit about how to make sure you can do that as efficiently as possible. Attendance concerns. We will handle attendance as a part of the eSchool program. It is recorded in PowerSchool. So folks at your zone school will be able to see it. But if there are any issues or concerns, it will be handled at the eSchool. Any attendance intervention plans, we will conduct those here. Map, several, um, several different types of tests will be handled through the eSchool, like map testing. We will handle map testing through the eSchool program. And if there are any exceptions, because things do change sometimes with regards to that, and Ms. Armstrong is our um, school testing coordinator, and she went to okay. a meeting yesterday where she learned some additional information, but as that information becomes available, she will be contacting families. The most important thing is that you may still get information from your homeschool about testing, and you should, you should um, listen to information that comes from eSchool and eSchool teachers. So I wanna say that again, that if you are communicating, there's no way for us to disconnect you from your, your zone school. So it is very important that you understand that if you receive communication about map testing on the 15th, and we've communicated that we're map testing on the 14th, then you need to go with the 14th, okay? Um, that's just an example um, of information um, that sometimes gets, a, that we realized this past year was a bit confusing. And last but not least on this list, which is not a comprehensive list, there are other pieces, um, are 504s and IEPs. And we, we handle that in the eSchool program. Now we will, might have support from your zone school by talking to um, your former 504 coordinator or your um, former special ed teacher um, that served your student or served you if you're a student listening to this. Um, but we, we will facilitate meetings through our program. Okay, any, I will take questions at the end with regards to that. I was about to ask for questions, guys. Back in my teacher mode. Okay, so we're going to move on to academic attendance and discipline expectations. And we try to make this as streamlined as possible. Please know that we will be sending next week additional information. Some will come directly from the eSchool administration, but a lot of it will come from the eSchool teachers 
who next Friday will be sending out information for students to log in um, on the 18th. And so we will be sending information to parents and students and teachers, your individual teachers will be sending you information to welcome you to the new school year. But these are general expectations for academics, attendance, and discipline. I wanted to share with you guys, um, especially parents, and I think students probably don't care this much about this, but that we do have an e-learning framework that is modeled on our traditional schools, our comprehensive middle and high schools expectations. So there are instructional expectations as far as the instructional model. Um, across the district, we're a Google for Education district. So your students are going to be focused a lot on using the Google suite of products, but it, just like their counterparts who are going to school face to face, we have best practices for e-learning and our teachers are spending a lot, of, have spent a lot of time and will continue to spend time on professional development to ensure that your students get what they need. And so I wanna assure you of that as we're moving forward. And that leads directly into what our expectations are for students. Um, first and foremost, and I'm gonna talk about attendance in a second. And this is very important because this is one of the probably um, the biggest differences between last year and this year are attendance expectations, which tie directly to academic expectations. First and foremost, we need students to attend all assigned classes and complete all assignments as given. It is important that you are in time to class mm -hmm. for a number of different reasons. Most importantly is that if you miss five minutes of your class, that's five minutes of instruction that you've missed. So it is important that you're on time. It also is going to affect or may affect your, your attendance this year. So we'll talk about that in a second. Participate in mandatory intervention sessions for students who have poor academic performance. So this year, there will be expectations really across the district. So I do want to make it clear that this is not necessarily just an e-school um, practice. Across the district, we are um, at the middle school and the high school level, elementary has had it all along, but at the middle school and the high school level, we're adopting new practices with regards to intervention. And so students will be expected and parents will be contacted as such when they are not performing adequately in their classes to participate in, act, um, participate in intervention. And those intervention periods will be at different times for middle school and for high school. So we will share that information also and explain to you what students are expected to do in that. Our goal is ultimately for students to be successful. And so if you're not successful, that means that you likely need additional time and support. And that's what intervention serves. That's how, that's the purpose of intervention. We want you to pay attention, participate and ask questions and put 100% in all work that you complete. That is extraordinarily important, okay? That brings us to attendance expectations. And remember I said a second that this is probably the most significant change um, to our practice um, in virtual learning. E-school students will have the same attendance expectations as other students across the district. Let me repeat that again. E-school students will have the same attendance expectations as students across the district. This year, there is no DPA, that daily participation assignment for students who decided they just didn't want to go to class on this day. Um, that is, there is no such thing as the DPA this year. That was something that the State Department of Education allowed last year that they are not allowing this year. So students must be in attendance with their cameras on to be counted present. That is extraordinarily important. Also, if you miss more than 20 minutes of a class, whether you're a middle school student or a high school student, you are counted absent. That is important. And that is about the amount of time that you're required by the state of South Carolina to be present in a class, okay? So please, please, um, parents, guardians, please make sure that your students are where they're supposed to be when they're supposed to be there. Um, and we have practices in place to inform parents if students aren't where they're supposed to be, and we will be um, talking in greater detail, this is a very broad overview, but we have a very specific checklist that after a certain number of um, absences, student, parents will be contacted, teachers will be expected to contact you. Um, and we're encouraging students to really keep up with, with it themselves um, over time. 
parents must submit an excuse to the attendance secretary for all absences within five days of an absence. And we will be sharing a Google form to try to make that as easy as possible for you. So you don't have to drive a, a, um, an excuse up here. You just complete the form. And something that um, is extraordinarily important that we learned last year, by state law, this is not a district policy or an e-school policy, you must submit an excuse for every day. So if your student missed five days, you can't just submit one, you've got to submit an excuse for each of those days. And that's a requirement. And that's something that actually I will be honest with you that we learned last year when we were, when we were asking parents to, to submit that information, they were submitting it in a group and we were told that they had to go back and, and submit those individually, um, especially if they're sporadic. So if, they're, if they've missed you know, five days in a row, that's different from missing one day a month between August and December. Um, you have to have an individual excuse for each of those explaining the, the, the reason for the apps. And again, we're going to be working on a Google form to, to make that a little bit easier for you guys this year. Um, this is the middle school and high school daily schedule. And this was shared earlier with you guys in the, um, in the SMORE newsletter. And we will continue to share this with you over the next um, and the, over the next week. And teachers will share this information. There is one piece that is not um, sh that does not show on this slide that we will make sure um, is included, and that is for high school students. The district is going back to late start Wednesday for everyone. So our students will also participate on in late. Um, and late start on Wednesday morning. So our schedule will be slightly different as teachers are participating in professional development on Wednesday morning. And so we will share that schedule with just the high school families um, before the beginning of the, the school year. Um, we, will not have late, we will not have late start the first Wednesday and we will share with students, there, was, there are several Wednesdays over the course of the school year. And those of you that have been in high school or have had students in high school, you know this already, on days when we have ACT or SAT testing during final exams um, or semester exams or our final end of year exams, we don't have late start on those days. We have a full day schedule and we would follow whatever bell schedule we have for um, the, the session at that time. And we communicate that, we will communicate that in advance, okay? Discipline expectations. Students, even though students are at home, they are expected to follow Richland II's discipline expectations. What will be different is the consequences that students have to serve in the virtual in, um, environment. That may vary slightly with regards to how students, um, the consequences that students might receive um, due to any disciplinary infraction. And so one of the things that I did want to talk about is really the most common um, discipline uh, infraction that we had to deal with last year, which was just frankly misuse of technology. So please remember the teachers can see your students um, on their Chromebooks. Please review the AUP. Each of you, when you enroll your student um, and do the annual enrollment, part of one of the things that you check off is that you, you yourself and your student has gone over the acceptable use policy that speaks to things like you can't be on this website during instructional time. And in some cases, you can't be on this website with a district device. So the district has given some latitude for students, you know, after school hours, if you want to go to TikTok, in most cases, students can do that, but that is not appropriate during the school day. And I would say that 95% of the disciplinary infractions, and we did not have tons last year in our virtual school students, but I would say that the majority of those that we had to deal with was misuse of technology. So please make sure that your student um, is using the te technology, especially during um, instructional time, during the school day, between those hours that, was on, that were on the previous slide, that they are using their device appropriately. That is extraordinarily important. And again, if you have any questions about that towards the end, because you are sign, you do sign off at when you do your annual enrollment that you have read this and you and your student have gone over the acceptable use policy. Additionally, our um, additionally our teaching staff is also going to. Um, go over their expectations with every single student. And we're gonna hold students to account, especially our middle, our young adult 
middle and high school students, that we're not going to ask them to do anything that we think is beyond the capability of a middle school and a high school student. And so um, we will give additional information, more specificity with regards to consequences. I will also say, since I said the number one disciplinary infraction, the, the number one consequence I would say to students misusing the um, mixed using their device after a warning. We always gave a warning and spoke to the parent, um, uh, I spoke to the parent about the situation. But if there was a second infraction, we would suspend student from use of the device. And we can do that here at this level, which counts as a suspension for the student and it goes in their permanent record. So it is very important that students are doing what they're supposed to do. So don't think just because they're virtual and they're at home that we, um, that there aren't situations where a suspension is warranted for a student. Okay, so I'm now going to turn over um, the presentation to um, Mrs. Tisha Gibson, who's our Director of Counseling, who's gonna to talk to you a little bit about Parent Portal, accessing grades, attendance, and how to read your schedule. So thank you, Ms. Gibson. And I will pile it if you'd like for me to. Sounds great. Okay. Thank you. Um, good evening, um, everyone. Again, um, I am Tisha Gibson, and I am the school counselor for the virtual school program. Um, I just wanted to start off with a little reminder about the difference between asynchronous and synchronous learning, because that will be important as we talk about um, electives especially. So when we talk about asynchronous learning, um, this is basically where students are working at their own uh, pace uh, during a time that they deem appropriate. However, we will carve out time during the school day for students, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, feedback will come via whatever platform the student is using, so virtual SC or our district virtual high school program. Um, it is very flexible um, versus the synchronous learning where it's probably what you would think of as more traditional, where students will log into their Google Meet, they'll meet with their teacher, um, each day, there'll be attendance, there'll be, um, you know, instant feedback um, in those settings, so much like a normal classroom. So I want to make sure that you guys understand the difference. Um, okay, I know schedules are the burning question for most um, families at this time. Um, we will be emailing, um, hopefully, if it works out. If not, we're going to put it in the uh, postal mail. Um, schedules uh, to each of our families. Um, this will allow you to better distinguish the difference between first semester uh, classes and second semester classes. Um, and we'll do that by August uh, 16th. If we'll go to the next screen, I can show you, however, when you log into Parent Portal, there is a way for you to view the classes that have been assigned um, to your child. Um, so when you log into Parent Portal at the very top, there is a link that says grades and attendance. When you click on this link, you're going to see that there are two tabs at the top. The first tab will always be grades and attendance for whatever your child's zone school might be. Um, we have some students um, that may be taking, um, as Dr. Manigo said, orchestra, band, JROTC, those things at their home school. That is where you're going to see um, their grades, their attendance, their teachers, access to all of that for their homeschool. On the very next tab, it's going to say grades and attendance for BMS for middle school or BHS for our high school um, students. When you click on that, you're going to see all of the virtual uh, classes, the teachers, the grades, the attendance. You can also access email um, addresses for all of the teachers um, via this particular link. Um, we apologize that when you click on the My Schedule link that the actual schedule isn't linked there. That is one of the drawbacks of having students linked to both their zone school and our um, virtual school program at this time, but we do hope to rectify that issue um, moving forward. But that is where you can see. So um, right there where it says periods, it lists the periods, um, it lists the order of the classes. The only thing that may be a little hard to distinguish is whether it's a first semester class or a second semester class. If for some reason you cannot get into your parent portal account, please contact the registrar or the student data coordinator at your child's own school and they can reset that information for you. Um, it's important to note that students um, 
if a parent has a parent portal account, um, students can also access their parent portal account. So they can see um, the same information uh, for the most part, especially when it comes to grades and attendance that you can see. So a lot of parents just have their children pull that uh, up for them and they look at it together. Go to the next slide. All right, uh, just a few things about grades um, in Parent Portal. Um, if you, once you, once we get started with grades, you'll be able to see um, what your students uh, are currently, what grades they're earning um, at the time. When you click on the grade itself, if we'll go to the next screen, um, you will be able to see a breakdown of the individual assignments for that particular class and teacher. A couple of things to note, um, if you see the orange exclamation point, that means that your child's assignment is missing. If you see the pink clock, that means your child's assignment is late. Um, if you were to see the dash that's circled in red, that means that the teacher has excluded that grade um, from your child's overall grade. So it's not hurting them, it's not counting in any way. Um, and then on the uh, far right would be view where it says, uh, those are teacher comments. So you can click on that. And a lot of times teachers put, um, they explain the assignment, they explain the expectations. If something um, has gone awry, they'll put um, an explanation in there. So that's a good place to check when you're first kind of researching what's going on with your children's grades. Go to the next slide. All right, again, another burning question. Can I change my classes? Um, I will say because we are a small program, um, we are not able to offer the number and variety of electives and classes that a traditional uh, school would offer. Um, however, we do uh, give some latitude to changing um, your classes. There are a couple of options uh, which will be linked in the presentation that Dr. Menigo is gonna share with you. Um, but there are two asynchronous options. So again, remember, don't necessarily have to log in at a particular time. Students can work at their own pace um, and uh, monitor, will be able to monitor those grades in a separate platform. So the district virtual high school, there's a list of classes that are offered um, through there. Uh, parents will need to complete the permission form in order for me to register their child in one of the district virtual high school classes. Um, some families choose to use the South Carolina Department of Ed's virtual program, virtual SC. Um, in that case, students and parents will need to register themselves through the virtual SC website. Um, and then there are um, R2I2, uh, Richland Innova uh, Institute of Innovation courses that are available. Um, and there is a link with a list of those. Most of those right now will be in person. Um, those are things like pastry and baking, um, mechanical engineering, uh, social media marketing, um, Apple app design. Uh, those again will be uh, in person with the exception of next energy fuel cell engineering, which looks at alternative uh, uses of energy. That will be a completely virtual class. We do have some synchronous elective options, which include Spanish one and two, journalism, entrepreneurship, and fundamentals of computing. I will say right now that those classes are pretty full because they're pretty popular, um, but space may come available um, in those courses. We'll go to the next one. Um, there are two ways that you can make changes um, to your schedule. You can complete the schedule change form, which I do encourage um, mainly because there's one of me and a lot of you all. Um, and I would do that if I'm only trying to drop a study hall for a class that I know I already know that I want. Um, so let's say, you know, accounting one is a popular one. I could just go ahead and fill out the form. I will add that course and take care of that, no problem. If there are more complicated things and you want to have a discussion, you can use the link um, and I'll share it in the chat uh, as well to set up an appointment with me over the next week. Um, and we can do a Google Meet to discuss whatever issues you may have regarding your um, schedule. But those appointments are limited to certain times just because there is a lot going on over the next several days. Next slide. Um, just a reminder that there are, um, 
as Dr. Nanago said, a few classes that must be done in person. So students will be required to physically go into the building. They will be required to participate in any performances um, that take place in chorus, band, orchestra, dance, theater, JROTC, and like I said, R2I2 classes. If your child still wants to participate in those, again, on the schedule change form, I give you an opportunity to just indicate to me, you know, I want my child to take orchestra. I'll work with the um, zone school to get that added to your child's schedule. And more than likely, we'll have to have a conversation with you and with your child to make sure that uh, transportation is available. We won't be able to provide transportation to the school in order for that to happen. So we would need to work out a plan um, to make sure that transportation is available and then to make sure that your child understands you know, where to check in when they arrive and where to go when they need to be picked up and, and how that will take place through um, the front office or the front desk area. Well, next question. And last but not least, we had a lot of questions last year about this. Um, once I start filling student schedules with our asynchronous classes, um, I will be switching their study hall to a class called computer learning. And really what that is, is it's a tag for me so that I know that your child is working on a class through virtual SC or through the district virtual high school program. Um, it is also a designated uh, period of time in your child's schedule uh, that we you know, recommend that they use so that they don't fall behind in uh, the asynchronous classes that they are taking. Because again, with asynchronous classes, there um, aren't necessarily, you know, teachers standing over them to say, did you get this work done? Did you do that? Um, although there will be contact made from the virtual district virtual teachers, letting you know if your child is falling behind. But we give you this time during the school day um, to work on the classes. Uh, you, your child will not have to log into a Google Meet during this time period. It is just for them. Um, and then as far as the grades go, you will not actually be able to see the completed grade um, or the actual grade until your child completes the course. However, your child can always log into whichever platform it is, virtual let's see your district virtual, pull up their account and they can always show you their grade. Um, if you have questions, I can share information about grades for the district virtual high classes. However, I cannot see the virtual SC classes. Um, those will have to be approved by your child's zone counselor um, and your zone counselor can access um, that information about virtual SC grades. Um, with that being said, I do wanna say that I, I do work very closely with all of our middle school and high school counselors um, so that if there's anything that's going on, they try to let me know so that I can convey that information to you. Um, you know, if ever there are questions, I don't mind going to them on your behalf or getting information, um, but I just wanted to let you know that um, it's like your, your child gets two counselors um, this year. So uh, feel free to come to me first because they're probably gonna direct you to me first. Um, and if I can't um, at, answer your question, I will go to them and get whatever answers we need. That's it Ms. Gibson. Let me yes. add this real quick. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm the lead teacher for our district virtual high school. And we will, if your student is taking a course in Edgenuity, which is the learning um, platform that we use, I will set up a parent account because even though the grades aren't going in parent portal or, or power school until the end of the year, you will be able to log in. You'll have your own account. You can log in and check your student's progress check you know what they're doing or not doing in some cases um so you will also have that option so um i will send out more information once your students if they're enrolled in a course through the uh, district virtual high okay Thank you, Ms. Gibson and um, Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong, I was actually gonna ask you to, to talk a little bit about ingenuity here. Um, so thank you for sharing that, that information um, up, up, up with regards to ingenuity specifically. And I will say that Ms. Armstrong is the lead teacher working with not just our e-school students, the students that are we're here about this evening, but also our traditional virtual school students who are attending school at their zone schools, but maybe taking a class for um, a remediation or acceleration, both of those situations. 
I think this is also an opportunity to say, especially for our upperclassmen students, that we do have some dual credit opportunities that are available um, through the virtual school program, especially students that are interested in the medical field. And so if you might be interested in a dual credit course, when, for those of you that um, may never have heard of that before, that's where you receive college credit and high school credit for a course that counts towards your high school gra um, graduation, but also will count towards your um, towards college. We do have a couple of offerings um, through the virtual program and access to other courses across the district. Um, um, and so if you're interested in that, please let Miss. those are not on the list because those are not very common, but please let Miss Gibson know, and that may be a situation where she will assign you a computer learning while you are working on a Midlands Technical College course. Um, we also have some courses through USC Sumter and some other institutions, but we primarily work with Midlands Tech um, in the virtual school program. So thank you both. So this brings us to technology re requirements and expectations. And we've hit upon some of this already. And um, these are very important. And I would say non-negotiables to be a part of this program. It's a little bit more difficult to say that this year um, compared to where we will be next year, hopefully, um, hopefully post-COVID, I was saying the same thing last year this time, where you know this will be a, um, a choice option for students, but it will be a selective choice op option um, for students. One of the most important things is reliable internet service. So families, it is very important that you have access to reliable internet service if your student is a part of this program. All students will be assigned the Chromebook and we are always asked the question, well, my student has an iPad, my student has a Dell computer they like using. For the purposes of their classes that they are taking synchronously through us, they really need to use the district Chromebooks. And definitely they need to use the district, um, district uh, Chromebooks if they are doing any sort of testing because those require a lockdown browser um, that all the students in the district have. And so if we ask students to come into the building for their, um, come into the building to take a test, they will need to have their Chromebooks charged um, and ready to go when they come into the building. Um, access to the Google suite of tools, especially Google Meet and Google Classroom. I'm going to say over and over, the most important thing that students and parents, I would say, need to know how to use um, is the district email, which is Gmail um, and Google Classroom. Students are expected to check their emails regularly. And, what, and, and because people always ask, what does that mean? I'm going to give you an expectation that students should check their emails at least twice a day, beginning of the day and at the end of the day, in order to keep up with messages. Email in Google Classroom is the primary method for communication outside of the classroom. We expect our teachers to communicate with their students in the classroom like they would in a traditional setting. But if there's additional information or if they want students to redo something or if there's a change to the schedule, that is how it will be communicated to virtual students. And so, as I said a few minutes ago, you know, as we're looking to build the virtual program beyond COVID, one of the things that's very important is that we're, we are looking for students who um, who are not just interested or thri thrive in the virtual environment, but are mature enough to handle the, this. And maturity mm. comes with age, but maturity also comes, um, and with experience, age and experience. But uh, maturity is something that is learned. It can be learned. And so these are things, this makes it extraordinarily important for students to keep a schedule, um, to make sure that if they have to put it, you know, someplace with a bell that rings at their cell phone that says, I need to check my email, First thing in the morning, I need to check my email at the end of the day. That is extraordinarily important. And this goes back to, again, you know, mm -hmm. often students will say, well, no one told me that. Please remember that, um, that there's a record. If your teacher sends you an email, we have the record from the teacher that they sent the email when they sent it. And we can even tell if the email was open or not. We can tell if it was deleted. There have been situations where students have just, you know, I see Ms. Armstrong, I'm sending it straight to the, to the trash pile. So please know that we can see all of the, that information. Please, students that are on here, um, please, you know, ex exhibit the life skill of maturity um, and responsibility as we're talking about these things. And, and again, our job is to really help you with that. And, um, and so we will be building towards that. And, and parents, if you need support with that, please let us know, both Ms. Gibson 
Mrs. Armstrong and I worked with students individually last year to help, you know, set up their, their calendars um, and make sure that they um, knew exactly what they needed to do. So if you need help with help, um, help um, and you can't help your student with organizing in that way, we will be happy to meet with them one-on-one -on -one and preferably with you also to sort of go over what needs to be done um, to set up a really good schedule for your students so that they know where they're supposed to be when they're supposed to be there. So um, thank you very much for that. So standardized assessments. We've had a lot of questions about standardized assessments. So before we even start with this, I'm gonna begin by saying a lot of this is outside of our purview. And not just because we're a program, but just because at this point, um, it has been made clear that some of the rules that were established last year are no longer in, in, um, in effect. So students are required to attend sessions for federal and state mandated face-to-face -face standardized um, assessments. And maybe I should, this gives, and I talked earlier today about changing face-to-face -to, -face to in person. So this is in-person standardized assessments. Let me say that again, in-person standardized assessments. So there are things like SAT and ACT, which students have to complete at their zone school, because again, we're a program, not a school. ACT and SAT are not going to give us um, the required um, uh, licenses to administer SAT and ACT. So they have to do that at their zone school, but there's also no provision for students to take that um, in a virtual environment. They have to be um, face to face um, for those. Um, uh, this, so far this year, again, anything could change. This is if any of you listened to Dr. Davis last night, he talked about the fluidity of kind of changes that are happening. But as of right now, the State Department of Education has revoked all waivers that they gave us last year for testing things like MAP and um, virtually, those things now have to be done face to face. So we will send out information um, to you guys to let you know where your student needs to report, where they need to be to participate in testing. And what we're going to do is take steps to stagger attendance because we know that a lot of our families this year are choosing virtual, not because their student thrived in this environment and that's, this is where they're, the way their student learns best or that they needed the flexibility for some reason, but they're doing it because of COVID. And so we will do what we can to stagger attendance and socially distance students during testing, but there are no provisions this year for opting students out of testing. And I'm going to say that is not a district, um, that is not a district practice or policy. Those expectations are state and federal. And so it is expected that your students participate in those testing. And almost always I hear um, families ask, well, what will happen if I don't, um, let, uh, if I don't um, have my student uh, attend these testing sessions? We don't have any control over that. And we don't have an answer to that. I'm going to tell you that the expect we will communicate if, um, if asked at our level that we've given your student the opportunity and we've communicated that where they're supposed to be to complete testing. And so um, again, if just in case that question comes up later, what's gonna happen? I don't have an answer to that because it's not our mandate that students come in for um, testing. But I do wanna make sure that it is clear that there is no provision for students opting out of uh, the, the required test, test. Okay. So we're now at a place where we're gonna get to your questions. And thank you for those of you who um, took the opportunity to send in some questions when I sent out the newsletter earlier this week. We um, gave the opportunity for you to um, post some questions, and we just had a handful of what I said were softball questions, and I told you I thought we'd get some more difficult questions, and, um, and we have in the chat. So I'm going to start with the questions that we got in advance, and then I'm going to go through the chat and answer the questions that were in the chat. So um, first question, what are the program commitment expectations? This year, students at the middle school and high school level will be allowed to return to their zone schools only at the semester, okay? Students may return to their home schools only after the semester. There are a couple of exceptions to that and students must apply to return. So one of the most important pieces is that if a student is not demonstrating um, success in the virtual environment, we can, um, we can actually ask um, the, that they be returned and there's, there's a process for that because ultimately we want students to be successful. And if they're not successful at home because there's too many distractions 
at home or they're not success they're not successful at home because um, they're just not mature enough to handle that there will be a process in place to return students to their zone school um, but for parent requests that will have to happen at, um, in January for middle school and high school students requests will only be accepted if space is available at their zone school so that's also important so they may have to stay for the full year but we're going to do everything to um, that we possibly can do to um, to return students if that is the desire of the family. Um, we cannot guarantee access to specific courses if your student returns to his own school. So we want to make sure that if your student goes back and, uh, for example, in the chat a few minutes ago, someone um, asked about culinary arts, which we do not offer um, through our virtual program um, currently. Um, they, um, we can't guarantee that they're going to get a spot in culinary arts. And so just want to make sure that that's, that's clear. What about athletics, fine arts, and JROTC? And Ms. Gibson talked about this a little bit earlier, and I spoke about it just a, a bit before that. Students in the East School are still attached to their zone school and are allowed to participate in athletics and performing arts in those locations, as well as JROTC. Um, students must participate in those activities in place, in, in, in person. There's no such thing as virtual football. So you've got to know that your students are going to um, are going to have to participate in those um, those ac activities at their zone school, and that we don't control social distancing or any of the requirements um, that schools have for students in their participation. So students, we also can't guarantee a, them a spot. They're not holding spots for virtual school students any more than they're that they any more than they would hold a spot for a student in their program. So if your student goes um, uh, tries out for football or tries out for the school play, there are lots of examples um, of this um, that fall outside of athletics um, or participate in JROTC and are on the drill team they must meet the requirements in order to participate in those programs. And we don't have any control over those. The individual um, schools and their, um, their uh, faculty designee controls um, those pieces of the puzzle. And um, things like JROTC, um, and I will use BAN as an example. If you want your student to participate in drill team um, ROTC if for junior ROTC or marching band, um, those are things that also have a requirement that students participate during the school day in those activities. So you would have to transport your student. We don't provide transportation for any of these things. As Ms. Gibson said, you would have to provide transportation. Again, this is no different than any other program, any other magnet program in our district. Okay. Next, what about big celebrations like the prom, promotion ceremonies and graduation? Students in the East School, again, you're going to hear, see me repeat this several times, are still attached to their zone school and, and will participate in big celebrations with their cohorts at these locations. So they will participate in promotion, promotion ceremonies and a graduation, certainly graduation in the prom at their zoned or assigned school. We will also recognize students throughout the year for things like honor roll, those things with as a part of our program. So students in those cases may get double recognized. We certainly don't have the, the ability to put on a prom um, for, uh, you know, for 100 students. So those students would participate with their, you know, participate with their schools. And, um, and so if there are any specific questions about celebrations, if you would reach out to me or Ms. Gibson or Mrs. Armstrong, we will give you uh, additional information. If you reach out to us, we'll point you in the direction of who you need to speak to. And I have a couple of other examples and things that we'll talk about. Okay, what about school pictures and the yearbook? Students, again, are still attached to their zone school. They will be in a yearbook at their zone school. We will not have, if anyone who's ever been on a yearbook committee, you know what it takes to put a yearbook on. We do not have the staffing to, to have a yearbook, um, even though we will do recognitions throughout the year and may ask you for your students' pictures for those virtual um, or digital presentations. But yearbooks will be, will be um, done at a student's school. And um, seniors should also take their senior pictures. I know some seniors have, but some um, have not at their school's de designated location, whether it's offsite or at the school. Um, please contact the student activity director at your student's zone school for additional information. But one of the things that we are going to do, usually pictures um, take place in around October for most schools. 
and um, senior pictures. If your student has missed the senior picture this summer, because usually they do that during the summer, that's usually when they do makeup also. And so we are going to do what we can to gather that information and share it just with the students that it affects. So we will send the Blythewood students their information for senior pictures or school pictures, and we will do the same for Westwood and every other school. So stay tuned. Once we get that information, we will share that information out um, to our students so that they can make an appointment to go take care of that. And what we'd like to do is to actually see if the school will schedule a time considering that most of the families that are participating in the virtual school are doing it, doing so because of COVID, that there may be a designated time, maybe early or, or late in the afternoon after all the other students are finished where our students can go in and get their pictures taken um, during that month. So we're trying to do everything we can to give greater consideration to our students. Um, will there be a PTO or an SIC? And this made me smile. I, I know that last year we had great parents and it seems like we're gonna have great parents again this year because one of the questions that we got in our Google form was a question about um, helping to support our program. And that they would that um, this uh, family said that they would love to be a part of a PTO or an SIC. Both of those organizations are um, have specific restrictions that the e-school does not meet in, in order to be a part of the school improvement councils are required for by, for by the state of South Carolina for schools, but you also have, a, you have to have a school beds code, which programs don't have. And so um, we can't have a PTO or an SIC, but we can have what is called a stakeholders um, group. And so we are planning to pull together a stakeholder group um, that is similar to a PTO. We just can't call it that because we can't have a PTO, um, but um, we are going to pull a group together of families and students who um, want to contribute to the growth of our program. And so thank you to the family that asked that question. And we're excited about, um, about that opportunity um, with that. Now, um, we are now at the point, those are the questions that we received in advance. So now I'm gonna kind of go back through and try to pick up the questions that are asked along the way. And so um, one of the questions I think Ms. Gibson has already answered this was about putting the schedule change information in the chat. And she has done that um, already. And again, we're gonna share this presentation with you guys. And so you'll have access to the links that are included in the presentation as well as the video so that you can review it if you need to. There was a question about um, AVID. Um, and so Ms. Gibson has also answered um, that. Um, unfortunately, we were working on an AVID elective, um, but the person who um, was helping us with this abruptly retired during the summer. She, um, and she was our district AVID um, director. And, um, and so we are looking to see if there is going to be an opportunity there, but we cannot guarantee that. And so um, thank you, Ms. Gibson, for answering that question. And you may have answered all the questions along the way. Did you I along did. the way? Okay, so is there any of them, you know, then we're at a point right now, again, um, questions or comments. Um, and I'm gonna go back, this is the, really the last slide, but I'm gonna go back um, to this slide for families that came in after we started today or families who didn't get it when we put it up. Please, please, please. Um, take this uh, tiny URL, you can just write this out or this QR code and complete the information. It's just a brief Google form. Um, we're asking families to fill it out so that we can make sure that the information, the contact information we have for you, number one, matches in PowerSchool and number two, that is the best, it is the best contact information for you um, so that we are um, able to um, communicate with you as best we as best we can. So um, if there are any questions, I think at this time, if Ms. Gibson, if there's any questions that I needed to answer, did you pick up on any of those? You got them all? If anyone would like to unmute themselves, this is an opportunity for you to unmute yourself and ask a question or make a comment. I have a question. Um, so are only high school students allowed to make changes in the schedule? Ms. Gibson was shaking her head. I was going to let you answer that, but no. <laughs> no, the um, schedule change form that I posted in the chat allows both middle school and high school um, students to make changes. I will say on a middle school level, though, the number of electives that we have is a bit limited, um, but you'll be able to see those op options when you go to the schedule change form. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Okay. Hello? Yes. Oh. 
me and my husband wanted to know, is it possible for our children to go three days a week and have them out possibly for two? To do virtual. To do virtual. There is no option for hybrid this year. The state, um, the state of South Carolina made that clear that they, ex they expect students, even though they gave districts the option of um, having a, offering a virtual school program, such as what we're talking about right, right now, um, with limits, no more than 5% of the population uh, of the school district population can be a part of a virtual program and, um, uh, or the district will lose its state and federal funding. Um, so that's really out of our hands, but they have at this time tied our hands and said, no, you're either back full time or you are virtual. There is no in between. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes, I have a question. Hello. Hello. Uh, yes. Um, how, how are the lunch benefits working this year um, compared to from e-school to, uh, I guess, traditional face-to-face? Um, like how do how does parents need to apply and like how um will the parents receive like some type of or will the students receive some type of compensation as far as like lunch goes or how does how will that work for e-school? I, I can answer that one. Um, I will say that I encourage any of our families that have previously qualified for free or reduced lunch, or if you think that you qualify for free or reduced lunch, to go ahead um, and refill out that form. It's something you have to do every year. Um, again, because there are benefits outside of um, lunch itself, um, students can get access to waivers for SAT, ACT, um, and, and other benefits. So I encourage you, if you think that you do um, qualified to complete that, and that application can be found on the district website. Um, and I do think that the schools will be providing um, meal access, but that's information that we can get out to all of our families. Okay, thank you so much, Mrs. Gibson. Okay. And Could you place the um, slide up again that shows the forms for changing schedules? Yes. Thank you. That you're welcome. And Ms. Gibson, we just had a question about the fundamentals of computing course, counting towards um, counting towards an elective in computer science or computer science credit. It really only can count as one or the other, and most likely it will be the computer science credit because students must have a computer science credit um, in order to graduate. The only exceptions to that is occasionally, it just doesn't happen very often if a student takes that. If a student were, were to take a um, you know, coding class before they took fundamentals of computing, the, the coding class might count um, and the fundamentals might count as an elective. Either way, you would get credit for every class, but you can't double dip. So you can't count it as um, you know, you can't count it as your, this is for high school, you can't count a comp that computer science course as your computer science requirement and then count it as an elective also. It's one or the other. Um, but most students graduate, I would say that are not completing in the computer science. They, they just get the fundamentals and then they may go into the health um, healthcare field or culinary arts or another field. I hope that answered the question. Please unmute or put in the chat if I didn't answer that question. Yes, I have a question. Okay. okay. Um, I have a question about study hall. Yes, ma'am. Um, is that asynchronous or synchronous? Asynchronous. Is asynchronous, but do, do they have to sign in during that time? They do not have to sign in during that time. Um, we do encourage students that that is a great time for to seek extra help, especially if that may be when, as in a regular class setting, if their teacher is free during that time um, with their planning period, that may be a good time for extra assistance and to work on any as asynchronous classes that they're assigned to. So they do not, um, that you're absolutely correct, they do not have to um, log in and sign in for study hall. All right, thank you. Hello, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I wanted to know, I remember um, in a previous uh, virtual discussion uh, when you were explaining, I think it was last year when you explained about um, e-school uh, things and procedures and you were saying how um, I know at the lower level elementary, they were going to be on like on the computer full day, all in class all day long. But like when it got to high school students, um, it probably won't be as much 
of you know having to constantly stay stay on the computer and like stay in class so to speak um the whole day and that a lot of it was going to be um asynchronous mm -hmm. i wanted to know is has that changed is it the same way is or or will the high school students i'm referring to high school but will the high school students um will be like quote unquote in class from beginning the period starts to the end or is that just really based on what the teacher you know wants to do if the teacher lets them go and do asynchronous or if the teacher just doesn't have a meet that day and just says okay asynchronous work how is that going to work is that still going to be the same way not all day online in class it will be a combination so we are a virtual program that is is based in synchronous instruction for the majority of our students for the majority of the day. However, and I'll use this as an example because we had a, um, a, a family that I just worked with earlier this week. Um, and I, I don't know if Ms. Gibson has done the schedule, but I ultimately said that she needed to make her schedule request to Ms. Gibson. She needed some flexibility for sp very specific reasons. We are requiring at least two classes be synchronous at the high school level. Um, most students need that support. And so that's the reason. But if a student wants to take asynchronous classes where they're working on their own, there is greater flexibility and always has been. We have had um, the virtual school in Richland too for 20 years where students can take online classes where typically they would be in study hall or if they wanted to be accelerated. So it's a, really a combination and we're going to do what we can to meet the needs of students. But the majority of our students will be synchronous having to um, show up for classes. And if they are in a synchronous class, then a, you know attendance is attached and they are expected to be there and they're um, and signed in with their teacher. So a, a student might have their English and their math, for example, that's synchronous for the first two periods of the day. And then they may be taking asynchronous classes. So they're not on computer, necessarily on the computer all day. They have the flexibility of working at their own pace as long as they get through the course. Oh, OK. OK. I have a question about uh, school ID. Um, yes. How do we go about getting that for a student then? Um, and also, how do I verify his schedule is right now his schedule has um, different sub subjects already in it, but it's, I don't know if it's finalized yet. Uh, when I go online to see his class, he's a 10th grader. Um, and this is our second year doing the uh, virtual. Okay, so for any schedule changes, the slide that's up right now, if you can still see the slide, you can um, can again click click there to make any changes. But if it's that you're not sure that he has the schedule that he needs or you have questions about it, if you would select the second link, the Calendly, um, Calendly link, then Ms. Gibson will set up a time to meet with you to go over the schedule. So that's the best way to handle the schedule. And I think you had a question before that. Can you repeat that question, please? Yes, so the question was just only about school ID. Okay. Um, they have to get that at their zone school. We're actually um, working on a plan for that for students, um, which will involve, um, we just haven't finished working it out. And really it's because the state, um, you may have, may not have heard that the state is now requiring that all school IDs for students um, uh, are um, have a suicide prevention hotline on their IDs. And so mm -hmm. all the students across the district are getting new IDs. And so we are um, asking the schools, our plan is to ask schools reprint student IDs. The only problem is that it will have the ID that they already have in PowerSchool in the system. And if they don't have a, a picture in the PowerSchool because they're a new student or for whatever reason, then um, the student may have to come in and take a picture um, in some cases we've used previously, but again, we're still working on the details of this, um, have been able to send a picture in if they can legitimately say this is the student um, and that picture comes from a parent and they can print that picture in the system. Um, but um, we will either have some sort of pickup for parents um, to pick up those IDs or we will be mailing them out or asking you to pick them up from their zone schools. So that's mm -hmm. the plan right now, but we're still fleshing this out because this suicide prevention information is recent state law. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so just a quick question on what you just said about the IDs, because I actually called um, Spring Valley earlier today when I got their email about um, orientation, and I wanted to know um, if the student 
was going to be at the e-school, you know, doing e-school for this year and not returning back to in-person school until next year with that student still need to come and get their ID during orientation. And I was told no, if they wasn't going to be at school. Not so, during orientation. We will, we will let you know when you should pick them up or we will mail it to you or um, have you either pick it up, mail it. We're still working out the details for that. Okay, okay. The state law requires that we have the ID for the students, and we're we're actually going to do it in other ways because we do think it's pretty serious. The, you know, the that you know the emotional, social, emotional health of our students are important. So we're planning on sharing that information and um, having our teachers share it also, just so that we can push it out. But it is required, and so no, the students don't have to pick it up during orientation, but they will have access to an ID. Okay, thank you. I have another question. Um. So do middle school, when I look at the middle school schedule, do, do they change classes the semester or are their classes all year long? Because I only can see, you know, like one semester where I see like when you brought up the high school slide, you could see, you know, five, you know, fifth and sixth period for both, you know, semesters. Again, we're going to be mailing out those uh, schedules so that you will be able to delineate the difference between first and second semester. The majority of middle school classes, especially their core classes, will be year long. They will, with their elective choices, change um, mid-year in January. So they'll have a first semester set of electives and a second semester set of electives. Okay, so if the electives are the main things that I want to change, I wouldn't be able to do that until I got their, his schedule on the 16th. Is that correct? You can still see, I believe, you have the option at the top in Parent Portal to change the semester. Um, if not, you can still make those changes, like I said, via the, the schedule change form. When you go into the change form, you see all of the elective options that are available. Um, so if you know four, because that's basically they take two first semester and two second semester, uh, the four that your child wants per that child's grade level, you can go in and choose those at this time. Okay. And if you can't see it, just go ahead and again, make an appointment um, that with Ms. Gibson with regards to that, um, because you're saying you can't see it. Yeah, I can't see the second semester. It doesn't give me an option to look at the second semester. So I don't even know what his class would be second semester to make the changes that I need to make or not make. So Ms. Gibson, in that case, would you prefer that they just send you those four and then you can check and let them know? Yes, because there's only a set number of four, you know, set number of classes. So if you tell me the four you want your child to have, I can go ahead and make that change. And if there's an issue, I can give you a call. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gibson, any other questions in the chat? Ms. Armstrong, did you see any? Okay. I have one more okay, there was a question about Chromebooks. Do I have a question. Yes, okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Yes, ma'am, I'm sorry, thank you. Um, I was wanting to know about the fundamentals of computing um, and reading the description of the class. Um, I read the description, but I wanna make sure that fundamentals are meaning basic skills and that that's not on an advanced level more than the basic skills if I switch um, my son for that class. So the fundamentals of computing course is the, the lowest level computing class that is offered right now. Um, for um, computer, um, for the computer science credit. I will tell you that it is, it's not the old fashioned Microsoft Office or keyboarding course. The state is really expecting students to learn a little bit more about true computer science and coding. And so what I can tell you is that that is the lowest level course that's offered for that computer science credit. Um, I, but I, I'm pretty transparent. Those of you who have known me for a while, I try to be just upfront. You know, there are, there, there is coding in that. Students do need to, to have, that. they're going to experience that. Um, and so um, there's just no way around this with the new requirements for students with computer science. It's just not the same. It's certainly not what I needed when I graduated from high school a thousand years ago or when I started teaching 25 years ago. It is much more, um, the expectations are much greater. Did that answer your question? Yes, ma'am, it does. And I have another question, I'm sorry, for drama. Um, so when they did it last year, they was doing e-learning, but this year, if he's virtual, does he need to go 
to the Joan School for Drama or is she gonna stay virtual for drama? Ms. Gibson, okay. Yes, um, we are currently not offering drama as a synchronous virtual school course. So if a student were to take any fine art for the most part, so again, chorus, band, orchestra, drama, uh, theater, dance, all of those, that's drama, dance, all of those will have to be taken in person at the, at the student's zone school. So again, transportation will have to be provided to and from the school if your child goes in to take um, the class. And we'll have to work around how that schedule will fit the rest of your child's classes. Okay, thank you. Okay, and um, we're, we're going to just go for a few more minutes. And so um, if there are any other questions that you would like answered, um, please unmute at this time. So we're gonna go until about 6.50. We're already about 20 minutes over our scheduled time. So I don't want to, to hold folks here. And if you need to leave, please do, don't feel like you have to. Again, this will be recorded and we'll record up until the end. Um, but um, there's a question about registering for virtual SE courses. And I, Ms. Gibson may be preparing to answer that one. Um, there was this a statement about, do you wanna answer that Ms. Gibson? I was just gonna say virtual SC, the registration window opens August 18th for 11th and 12th graders and August 25th for 9th and 10th graders. Again, you will need to visit the um, virtual SC.org website in order to register. Um, that window for registration closes September 1st and classes begin on September 8th. Good evening, ladies, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes. This is Wendy Doberly, Abigail's mother. And first, let me just say thank you so much for all your hard work and for this wonderful informational session. Um, I have a general scheduling question Abigail brought up to me. Um, previously at our zone school, we'd had our zone counselor that, you know, every semester you kind of look at your schedule for next semester and, and they do a fantastic job of making sure you're meeting all the requirements to move to the next grade level. Um, of course, preparing to graduate from high school. Um, no offense, but you guys will take care of that, right? Like as we move through this semester, <laughs> as we move through this semester to the next semester, we'll make sure we're meeting everything we need to to move to the next grade level, right? Correct. Actually, um, I have spent the last uh, several weeks going through students' transcripts. Again, that is something that I do coordinate with the with the students' um, zone school. Um, last year, it's school dependent, but um, last year I did meet for individual sessions for ninth, tenth, and eleventh grade students to do their IGP to choose classes for the next year um, with Spring Valley and Westwood. I'm not sure if I'll be doing all of the schools this year. Um, and I also work with the middle schools to complete eighth grade as well. Um, but I do go through that information and do keep track of what students need in order to be promoted and in order to graduate. Perfect. We Thanks. stole Miss Gibson from Ridgeview um, the year before last because she is just the best. And she Great works here. very, I mean, I am not even saying that because she's on here. If yeah. she wasn't on here, I would be saying that. She works so hard to make sure that every student, I mean, like, individually has exactly what they need you know for the current year and going into next year so your kids Wonderful. are in good hands again thank you so much ladies i hope you guys get some rest tonight thank you, thank you. Um, and i will also say that if you have any questions about this just like um the, the school counselor at the at your student's own school just reach out to miss gibson and you know she'll go over it because i know sometimes especially you know i've been doing this for 20 years and i learn things all the time um, because things change all the time the state department requires the the computer science is, a, is probably the best example um I, I remember when every kid had to take keyboarding when i thought that wasn't necessary and now they have to have a computer science credit that's you know pretty substantial um so it changes all the time and so if you have any questions um you know miss gibson i can answer a lot of those mrs armstrong can also um but miss gibson is as the director of counseling you know just she just she she meets monthly with the rest of the team across the district. So we, we are meeting with the same people that your students would, um, that we would meet with if your students were in a traditional setting. So she can answer those questions. So um, thank you very much um, with that. Um, and Ms. Gibson, I think just answered the Chromebook replacement. I wasn't sure if I understood the question, but if you need a replacement again, that's at the student zone school. 
Any other questions? I have one last question. You may have already addressed it, but I missed um, it about the COVID-19 uh, vaccine um, for the second um, in injection. Will a notice go out you know, from the school, from the district you know, to let us know that um, when to schedule that or when it will be scheduled? I am not sure, but um, I, I think it's the point if you email me, you know, Miss Gibson, I think the next the second dose is August 14th. Okay, so do we and it's going to be at the um, headquarters, a drive by I mean, the drive through once again. I feel like it's at the same place that it was the first time. <laughs> Um, but I do know that the initial email that was sent out listed both the first dose and the second dose dates in locations, if you still have that email. Okay, I'll check that out. Thank you. And if you can't find that information, just email any one of the three of us and we can help find that information for you. All right, happy to. thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, and Dr. Manning, I have a question as well. My daughter is in eighth grade. Um, so I know at the end of this year, if they have like any type of, um, I guess, graduation or class day or something, how does that work with the virtual school? Would she go back to her zone school to do that? Yes, ma'am. We will do something digitally, likely, um, not face to face. Um, it just depends on where we, we are. We did something digital, but they will have the opportunity to um, to participate in the promotion ceremony at their school. Our students last year did exactly the same thing. So there'll be an opportunity for them to have space there. Again, we just don't control the social distancing and that sort of thing for families um, who are participating in the virtual school program because of COVID. So um, there, you do need to, to just be aware of that. But yes, they would be included in their school because technically they are still zoned for their school. That's their primary location. We are just serving them this year. Um, one last question that I have, like my daughter, I had her, um, she went for, to the Center for Achievement and then automatically went to Kelly Mill School yes, for sixth and seventh grade year. And because she went virtual, she was automatically registered back for whatever her zone school is. I wonder if there's a choice if they do have class day in terms of maybe uh, seeing whether she can, you know, have the class day with the school that she had always attended for the last two years. If you would put that in writing, I, it's a little early in the year for that. I don't know that. I, know. I, don't know that I, I don't know that the principal would be ready to answer that question right now. But if you put that in a writing and maybe wait towards the end of the year, I'll be happy to, to, to ask um, that question. Um, you know, we really did try to make sure last year that that kids were recognized at the school where they've been for a couple of years or a few years in the case of elementary for, for six years that they had an opportunity to graduate with their cohort. So, you know, I, we can ask, that's all I can say. I can't guarantee that. Okay. And yeah, I know it's kind of early, but I was just wondering, but thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you guys. Um, again, we are going to send this presentation out to you guys um, tomorrow afternoon, along with the slide presentation and some additional information. Between now and then, the best way to reach us is via email, just because of the quantity of phone calls we're getting right now, and that you know we we are we um, can spend time between meetings sometimes getting to those emails. Um, that's the best way um, to contact us. I will make sure that information is included in um, the information tomorrow so that you can reach Mrs. Armstrong, Mrs. Gibson, or myself. So thank you all very much. We appreciate y'all. Have a great evening. Um, just wanted to say oh, really the quickly, there are some students um, that were moved to the e-school within the last couple of days. Um, which means that I probably have not had a chance to get to their schedule. I am, I have done all the high school. I am working through the rest of the middle school students' schedules that were just moved over to us. So if you go into Parent Portal and you don't see anything, that may be the reason, um, but that should be updated uh, within the next 24 to 48 hours. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. So okay. Was that your question? I'm sorry. I thought you were waving goodbye and I was just waving at you. I'm so sorry. Was that your, was that your question?
so maybe so. Well, so. thank you guys very much. And um, we just appreciate you guys um, a lot. And we look forward to working with you. Have a good night. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Ms. Armstrong, let's hang on so that we can get this recording.